Hey there, welcome to this uh, revision video. It's basically a sort of synopsis video of the whole of the AP maths uh, that will be examined in grade 11. Most of it is around uh, statistics, but there's one little piece of algebra and we'll kick off with the algebra and then go on to the stats. Yeah, so just a word about uh, how to watch this video. I strongly recommend that you try and watch it kind of actively and by that I mean that you sort of uh, pause it from time to time and think about how you yourself would answer the question that's being posed rather than just sitting passively all right you'll learn a whole lot more if you if you're engaged so the only non-stats topic that will be examined in this uh, grade 11 ap maths exam is polynomial and rational inequalities and we, we we actually tested this in june so you guys should be totally comfortable with it but let's just remind ourselves of the kind of issues here so Essentially, an equation, sorry, an inequality is exactly like an equation, but for one thing. Right? If we multiply or divide by a negative quantity, then we need to remember to switch the inequality sign around. Okay, now a golden rule is therefore that we never multiply or divide through by a variable, because for example here, as tempting as it might be to multiply both sides by x, we don't know if x is positive or negative, and therefore we don't know whether or not we need to reverse the inequality sign. Okay, so let's look at the steps. So the steps in solving one of these, basically you want to get one term on one side and zero on the other. So I'm going to, I'm going to follow through with this question and kind of uh, do it as we do th go through the steps. So I'm going to subtract 4 over x from both sides. But right, now what I've got is I've got zero on the one side. I don't have one term on the, on the other side, I've got two. So I'm going to combine them, remembering that I'm going to add these algebraic fractions. I'm going to go with a common denominator of x. So I actually get x squared minus 4 over x is less than or equal to 0. Okay, right, that's the first step. Okay, fully factorize the non-zero side. If it involves a fraction, then ensure both the numerator and the denominator are fully factorized. So now this will go to x minus 2, x plus 2 over x less than or equal to 0. Okay, then it says, determine the critical values. These are the values which make each factor zero. So, two, negative two, and zero. Right, zero being the value that makes the factor on the denominator zero. Right, next, arrange them on a number line in the correct order, okay? So, I'm gonna just uh, draw a number line here. Okay, so I've got negative 2, then 0, and then 2. But then below the critical values, which make the numerator 0, write a 0. So minus 2 and 2, I'm going to put a 0 underneath here. Because this expression would be 0 if x was negative 2 or 2. Below the critical values, which make the denominator 0, so it should be a 0 in there, write UND for undefined. Right. Okay. Then fill in the signs for each factor along the number line. Since each is linear, it will change sign once only at its critical value. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sort of color code this a little bit and just use some different colors. Okay, so if we look just first at this factor, which I've underlined in red, to the left of minus 2, a number like minus 5, this factor would be negative. Between minus 2 and 0, like at minus 1, it would still be negative. Between 0 and 2, like at positive 1, it would still be negative. And bigger than 2, like at 5, it would be positive. Okay, next I'm going to do similarly with green pen for x plus 2. Right, to the left of minus 2, like at minus 7, x plus 2 will be negative. Between minus 2 and 0, so at minus 1, x plus 2 will be positive. Now, as I said, won't change sign again. So, in fact, it will be positive from then on. Right, lastly, I'm going to put in the signs of the purple pen for the value of x. Now, obviously, this will be negative here, negative here, it's zero here, so there, after it changes signs. Now, I'm going to revert to my blue pen, and my blue pen is going to be the sign pattern of the overall result. Now, if you've got three negatives multiplying or dividing by one another, you'll end up with a negative. If you've got two negatives and a positive, you'll end up with a positive. Two positives and a negative, a negative, and three positives, a positive. All right. So I've actually now done uh, 
the, the next step, which is to fill in the resulting signs underneath the number line, and they will alternate. And then write down your solution, right? Remembering that you cannot include values which make the question undefined. So we are looking, all right, for less than or equal to zero, we're looking for minus signs. So anywhere to the left, less than negative two, including negative two, will be absolutely okay. Or anywhere from zero onwards, not including zero, upwards to two, including two. All right, and that's the solution to this question. All right, the last sort of element of this says, you need to be comfortable expressing your answer using interval notation, inequality notation, which is what I've used so far here, or on a number line, right? So I'm just gonna quickly um, close out by doing those last two forms, right? The way we would write X less than or equal to two, we would write this X as an element, and I'm talking about an interval notation, minus infinity to minus two, Right, we'd put a square bracket on the minus two to say we are including it. We never put a square bracket on an infinity sign or a negative infinity sign. That one has a round bracket. Or, right, x is an element of, and now we want to go from zero, not including, so round bracket, up to two, including, so square bracket. Okay, and then the last one, is the last sort of form that we've got to be comfortable with is just using... Uh, or rather displaying our number, our solution rather, on a number line. Okay, we're going to do that as follows. Here's negative 2, and we're basically saying we can go anywhere to the left of negative 2, including negative 2, so we have a closed dot, or from 0, not including 0, up to 2, right? And we would put a closed dot there because we're going to include 2, but an open dot there because we're not going to include 0. Okay, so that's the end of that uh, that. Right, so let's tackle this one now. This is actually just a standard core math question. So I'm actually going to do it very, very quickly. I'm just going to go x squared minus x minus 12, greater than naught. Uh, we got zero on the one side. We're going to fully factorize the other side. Um, and we've got x minus 4, x plus 3. Now, one could draw a number line here and, and put in the values. But in fact, I would prefer to be able to picture this as uh, parabola and it's actually kind of a parabola that way up we know that because the leading coefficient is positive and we know that the x-intercepts here are at negative 3 and at 4 and now we ask ourselves where is this parabola positive where is it above the axis because remember when we're talking about its value we talk about its y value so where is it above the x-axis okay so and the answers to this are x less than minus 3 or greater than 4 Okay, so that really is uh, straightforward, and that's actually a kind of a core maths question. Right, let's look at another one. Okay, so this one we've got to first uh, subtract 2 from both sides. So I'm going to go 2x plus 3 over x plus 1, sorry, over x minus 1. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to minus 2, but in fact I'm going to write it, just to say some time, I'm going to write it straight into the same denominator with a view to combining these two fractions. Okay, All right, so over x minus 1, I actually end up with 2x, take away 2x, no x's, 3 plus 2. I actually get 5 over x minus 1 is bigger than or equal to 0. Right. Now, in fact, this is also easily solved. We don't even need a, a number line for this thing because I essentially need a, a, pos a positive number on the denominator. All right, so because if I've got a negative number on the denominator, then I'm going to get a negative result. All right, so in fact, basically there's only one critical value, which is 1. At this value, the thing is undefined. Sometimes I use the little dot for undefined, or write the word UND. Okay, and bigger than 1, this thing will be positive. All right, less than 1, it will be negative. All right, so in fact, we want to be positive, so we will, our solution here will be x greater than 1. We can't include 1 because it would make the question undefined. Right. I could write this like this in a different form. x an element of, sorry, not square bracket, round bracket, 1 to infinity. All right. And I won't do this one on a number line. I'll rather choose to do another one on a number line. Let's take a look at this one. I'm going to subtract 3 from both sides. So this is x minus 8 
over x minus, so it'll be in fact 3x over x, that's subtracting the 3. And then I'm going to add an x to both sides. And remember, I'm trying to get these with the same denominator, denominator so this is going to be plus x squared. Right. Over x, and this will be less than or equal to 0. Right, now I'm going to combine all of these uh, on the on the uh, left-hand side here. So I've got an x in the denominator. I've got an x squared. I've got a, an x and a minus 3x. That's minus 2x. And I've got a minus 8. And this is less than or equal to 0. And now I'll fully factorize the, denominator, the numerator and the denominator, rather, x minus 4x plus 2 over x less than or equal to 0. Okay, and then I put in my critical values, which are negative 2, 0, and 4, right? And now I'm going to do the signs, and I'm going to do the signs of this uh, top left factor first. So if x is less than negative 4, this thing will be negative, 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 and it switched its sign here to positive. Right, x plus 2 will be negative here, and then it will switch sign to positive, and it will be positive thereafter. And lastly, x will be negative until 0, and then positive thereafter. Right, the resultant sign pattern is negative, positive, negative, positive. I'm looking for negatives, but I can't include 0. Remember, and I didn't do this, but at negative 2, and at 4, I've got zeros on the top, which would give me 0. At 0, I've got a 0 on the bottom, which would make the thing undefined. Remember, I'm looking for negative signs. So x less than or equal to negative 2, or x from 0, not including 0, up to 4, including 4. And I'm going to draw this one on a number line. So there's negative 2, there's 0, and there's 4. Right, and I've got a shaded dot on the 4, an open dot on the 0, and an arrow going that way with a closed dot. Okay, one last one, just very quickly. Sometimes one can actually simplify the thing for oneself by realizing this is actually always negative. If you square something, it's always positive. If you put a negative in front of it, it's now always negative. If you subtract 5, it's kind of even more negative. This is always negative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by that quantity. This becomes x plus 4 over x plus 3, x minus 3. I'm factorizing. Remember, I've divided through by a negative thing, so I need to switch my inequality. Now I'll put my, my uh, critical values in. They are negative 4, negative 3, and positive 3, right? And now I do, and at negative 4, I get a value of 0. And at negative 3 and positive 3, I get values of undefined. Undefined. And then to the left of negative 4, this uh, thing is negative and then it becomes positive. This one is negative and becomes positive here. And lastly, the last one is negative right through to here and then becomes positive. Three positives give you a positive. Two positives and a negative and negative. A positive and two negatives are positive and three negatives are negative. Now I'm looking for negatives and zeros. So I'm going to go x less than or equal to minus four. Or I'm going to go from minus three to three, not including minus three and three. Right, so that brings us to the end of... of uh, rational and polynomial inequalities. Okay, welcome to this video on the statistics and overview of statistics for the AP Maths uh, matric syllabus. We're going to dive straight into counting techniques. And really, the whole issue of counting techniques is built around the fundamental counting principle. And that says that if one thing can happen in m ways and another in n ways, then there are m times n ways in which they can both happen. So let's see how this plays out in an example. How many four-digit numbers can I make using the digits 1, 4, 6, 7, and 9 if digits may not, uh, sorry, digits may be repeated? Well, in the first place, I've got a choice of five digits that I could use. Again, five, again, five, and again, five. And the fundamental counting principle basically says that I'm going to multiply those to get 625. If digits may not be repeated, 
then I've got a choice of five digits, then four, then three, then two for my four digit number. Let's now look at a, a probability question. In the case where digits may not be repeated, so these 120 different options, what's the probability that my number is bigger than 6,000? Well, in order for it to be bigger than 6,000, it needs to start with six, seven, or nine. So I've now only got a choice of three digits for the first digit. Then, because I've used one of those, I've got a choice of four for the next. I've now used two digits, then three, then two. And I end up with 72 out of 120 or 60%. It shouldn't actually surprise us that it's 60% because three of the five possible uh, starting digits would give us a number bigger than 6,000. So that's another way of, of thinking about that. Right, let's now look at the idea of a permutation and a combination. A permutation, and we get given both these two formulae and both of them can be handled by our calculator as well. A permutation tells us the number of ways we can select R objects from N objects if the order in which we select them is important, whilst a combination gives us the number of ways we can select R objects from N objects if the order in which we take them is not important. Right? Notice that the combination uh, uh, has two sort of uh, notations and we quite often use this, this bracket form. Also notice that for example, five combination two, which happens to be 10, is the number of groupings of two people I can take from five people if order doesn't matter. That is exactly the same number as five combination three. And the reason being is that every time you choose a group of two from five, you are inadvertently sort of not choosing a group of three. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between those. Okay. So let's have a look. In how many ways can I pick a chairman, a vice chairman, a secretary, and a treasurer from a group of seven people? So there are four roles or four positions. So it's literally seven permutation four. For example, if I pick Smith, Jones, Harrison, and Ward, right, that would be different to picking Smith, Harrison, Jones, and Ward. The reason being is that the different order in which I pick them is, is the sort of assignment of the positions. So the positions could refer to positions as in titles or positions as in kind of places or rankings. Right. In how many ways can I pick a group of four people from seven if there are no restrictions? Well, this is just a combination. The order is not important, so it will just be seven combination four, which is 35. Remember, I could also write that as seven, four, like that. Right. What about if Smith and Jones refuse to serve together? Well, here I'm going to use a conceptual trick of forcing them to be together. Right. In which case I need another two. So Smith and Jones are already chosen. So I've got five people left and I need to choose a further two. Five combination two is 10. Right. Now, remember there were 35 in 35 groups in total. 10 of them involve Smith and Jones together. So in fact, uh, 25 of them will, will involve Smith and Jones not together. Let's have a look if what if John will only serve if Mary serves? Well if Mary serves then we need an additional three people from any of the six including John which gives us 20. If Mary doesn't serve then John won't serve either so we would then need an additional well sorry we need four people but we could only choose them from five because of the seven Mary and John are are not serving. So that, that happens to be five. So in fact, there are a total of 25 ways that, that can happen. Right. In how many ways can I pick a team of five from three boys and eight girls if there are no restrictions? Well, it's just going to be 11 combination five. What if I need, though, at least four girls? Right. Now, that means, remember, I'm picking five people. I could either have four girls or five girls. If I've got four girls, then I need to pick my four girls out of my eight girls. And with each of those selections of girls, I need one boy from the three boys. And I must multiply those because each can happen with, with each. If I have five girls, then in fact, I need that I need no uh, no further boys, so no further people. So it would be naught boys from three. This, this, this number over here is just one. Okay. And I work them both out and I get my final answer there. Right. In how many ways can I seat eight married couples at a round table if each person must be seated next to his or her partner? 
Well, what I've done here is I've got Mr. and Mrs. Brown, Mr. and Mrs. Black, Mr. and Mrs. Green, and Mr. and Mrs. White. All right. Now, I've put a sort of rubber band around each of them. So effectively, I've got four people. Okay. Remember when we arrange objects around a circle, we actually subtract one from the four. So we get three and we factorial, three factorial. The reason I've multiplied by all these twos is each of these couples can swap around. All right. So, so there's, there's kind of a three factorial times two, times two, times two, times two, giving me a total of 96 different combinations or different uh, ways I can seat these people. Right, what we're going to do now is we're going to combine uh, some counting techniques and probability. And one of the formulae that we get given on the data sheet is this one. And basically it says that the number of, sorry, the probability of event A happening is the number of ways in which event A can happen divided by the number of elements in the sample space, the total number of things that can happen. So let's look at this question. I've got seven different shirts, three of which are short sleeved. I hang them all in the cupboard. What's the probability that the short sleeved ones end up next to one another? So what I want to do is I want to count, uh, firstly, the total number of array fins. And that will just be seven places for the first, seven choices for the first place, times six, times five, times four, it'll be seven factorial. Now what I want to count is the number of ways that the short sleeve shirts can be together. Number of ways that the short sleeve are together. And here we've kind of got a little conceptual trick, which you'll remember. We put a rubber band around the three short sleeve shirts, right? And then obviously we have four other shirts. We consider these short sleeve ones together as one shirt, giving us a total of five shirts. Five shirts can be arranged in five factorial ways. But for each and every one of those, there are three factorial different arrangements of the shirts inside the rubber band. So I need to multiply by that. So now the probability of the short sleeve shirts being together, and here's where we use this formula, the number of ways they can be together, which is five factorial over three factorial, Right, divided by the total number of arrangements, which is seven factorial. Right, this is actually quite easily worked out in one ten, because this is in fact seven times six times five times four times three times three times one, which is seven times six times five factorial. Three factorial happens to be six. Right, and so we've got five factorial times by six of the uh, numerator. The five factorials cancel. The sixes cancel, and in fact, I get a final answer of one seventh. All right. The next thing we're going to look at is is sort of arranging identical objects, and this formula doesn't get given. But if we've got n objects, a of which are identical to one another, and a further b of which are identical to one another, then we can arrange them in n factorial over a factorial, b factorial ways. All right. So let's have a look. How many different arrangements can I make using all the letters of the word arrangement, right? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different letters, right? So I'm going to get 11 factorial, but then I need to divide by two factorial for the repeated A's, two factorial for the repeated R's, and two factorial for the repeated E's, and two factorial for the repeated N's. Everyone knows that that's 2494800. Okay, let's look at this problem now. What's the probability that a randomly chosen example from these, these uh, arrangements here does not start and end with the same letter? Right, so the trick to work out the, how many don't start and end with the same letter is to actually work out how many do, all right? Now, the number that do will literally just be, uh, let's look at starting and ending with A, then there are nine factorial letters left, right? But we've got repeated E's, repeated N's, and repeated R's, right? Now the same would be true, so we've got that many that start and end with A, but they could start and end with A, or R, or N, or E, so if they need to multiply that number by four. Right, so this in fact comes to one eight one double four zero. Right, that's the number that do 
start and end with the same letter. The number that don't is obviously the difference between these two numbers, which is 231, 3360. All right, and then the probability of not starting and ending with the same letter will just be this number divided by our total of 2494 800. And that comes to about 92,7%. Quick reminder about standard deviation. Right, so what standard deviation is, it's a measure of spread. We're going to get given the following formula. All right, and in fact, this formula is actually for what we call variance. All right. Um, so in order to get our standard deviation from this formula, we actually have to do square root uh, variance. Right, now this formula looks more intimidating than it really is. This basically just means sum up from 1 to n, in other words, for each data item. All right, the difference between the data item and the mean, all right, squared. So you, and in fact, then you divide by the number of data items. So in fact, you average the sort of difference the difference is squared, okay? And that gives you your variance, and then you would square root that to find your standard deviation. The bigger our standard deviation, the more spread out our data is, right? And the smaller, the less spread out. Okay, so let's just have a quick look. So if we were to find the standard deviation of the following numbers, and we would expect you to be able to do this either kind of longhand without a calculator using the formula, all right? Or shorthand with a calculator. So let's just look at uh, an example of the longhand version. So we take, the first thing we do is we work out the mean, right? So we add up all these numbers, 6, 13, 24, the four numbers, so the average, the mean is actually 6. Right, now what we do, for each, we take uh, each data item and we take away the mean. So 2 take away 6, and we square that result. Right, then we add the next one, 4 take away 6, and we square that result, and 7 take away 6, and we square that result, and 11 take away 6, and we square that result. Right, this is 4 squared, which becomes 16. This one's negative 2 squared, which becomes 4. This one's 1 squared, which becomes 1. And this one's 5 squared, which becomes 25. Right, we add all of those up. We get 5 here, which is 30. We get 46, all right? And we divide by the number that they are, all right? So in other words, we average them. So 46 divided by 4, all right? And that is our uh, variance. So then we would square root it to find our standard deviation. So there's the standard deviation of those numbers. Quick reminder of how to do that on a calculator. Here we go, mode, stat, one variable stat. And we just put in our data items, 2, 4, 7 and 11. It's all clear. And then we go shift stat. And we go 4 for the variables about this data. And there are essentially three things we can find. We can find the number of data items, the mean of the data items, and the standard deviation. We're going to use this option here, number 3. So 3 equals. And we get 3, 3, 9, double 1. Right? If we were to square this answer, all right, you see we get 11.5, 11, 11 all right, and 11.5 is the same as 46 over 4. All right, so, so this is, this, we've got the same answer both ways. For the exam, you'll need to know how to uh, do both, both methods. So we're going to move out on to probability distributions. And what a probability distribution is, it's simply the way that the probabilities are distributed for a given context. So let's look at an example. Here we've got a spinner, all right, so we're going to spin this little red, uh, red, this little red arm, and it will settle and it will randomly select one of these numbers. There's seven sectors here, two ones, a two, a three, and three fours. So the probability of getting a one will be two out of seven. And we write it like this. The probability that big X equals little X is two sevenths if little X is one, one seventh to get a two, a one seventh chance of getting a three, and a three seventh chance of getting a four. So what this is showing us, it's showing us how the probabilities are distributed or shared for this particular context of the spinner. We could also graph them. So here we've got a just a kind of a, a bar graph, 
and we can see that the probability of a 1 is twice as high as the probability of a 2 or a 3, whereas the probability of a 4 is three times as high, and we've, we can actually read off the probabilities on the vertical axis. axis. Okay, right. So there's one last little thing that we need to do for probability distributions, and that's to be able to work out what's called the expected value. This is also known as the mean, right? And the variance, okay. And to be honest, I'm not sure why this is in the curriculum because we don't actually do anything with these, these values, <laughs> right? This is really easily worked out. Uh, this sigma is, is, a, is a symbol, it's a Greek S for sum. So it basically means add up the product of each x value with its probability right so in other words we're going to take two sevens multiplied by one so or one multiplied by two sevens so that's the x value multiplied by the probability and then we're going to add uh, the x value of two multiplied by a seventh and then we're going to add the x value of three multiplied by a seventh and then we're going to add the x value of four multiplied by three sevenths all right, we're going to work all of that out. It actually comes to two sevenths, another two sevenths, that's four sevenths, uh, three sevenths, seven sevenths, plus twelve sevenths. It actually comes to nineteen sevenths. All right, and that's what's called the, the sort of expected value. All right, it's actually the sort of, it's like a weighted average of our outcomes. Okay, nineteen sevenths is actually two and five sevenths i think i'm right I'm saying yeah two and five sevenths but that's sort of the the kind of the average score that's like the mean the mean score okay so that's the first uh, concept we need to be comfortable with and that formula is given on the form the next thing we need to do is to be able to work out the variance of uh of this of this distribution around and basically it involves the same formula, but what we do is we, and this formula is given, all right, we work out the expected value of x squared. So in other words, we take our x values and we square them. So we're going to, instead of multiplying 1 by 2 sevenths, we're going to multiply 1 squared by 2 sevenths. We obviously get the same result. Instead of multiplying 2, we're going to multiply 2 squared by 7. Instead of multiplying 3, we're going to multiply 2 squared by seven, and instead of multiplying four, we're gonna multiply four squared by seven. Right, and that's that's this piece over here, the uh, E of X squared. Right, and we'll just quickly work that out. Okay, and it actually comes to 63. Seven. So you'll notice that I've changed that, that uh, to three sevens, because uh, it should be three sevens, that probability. Okay, 63 sevens is actually exactly nine. All right. And then, in fact, the formula for the variance of this of this uh, probability density function, right, is just the e of x squared minus e of x all squared. So this will be uh, nine take away. 19 sevenths, this, this E of X is what we worked out here, it's a mean squared, so 9 minus 19 sevenths squared. Right, and we'll work that out. Come to 80 over 49. All right, so that would be the standard deviation, or oh, sorry, the variance of this distribution. Now we're going to continue our discussion of probability distributions. There are essentially two types. One deals with discrete data. Okay, discrete meaning it can only take on whole number values. For example, the outcomes of a die, the number of children, um, but continuous data can take on uh, a range of values, for example, heights or weights of people. A probability distribution which deals with discrete data is called a probability mass function, while one that deals with continuous data is a probability density function. 
When we're talking about a mass function, we're considering point values. In other words, the probability of having three children or four children. Okay. When we consider um, a probability density function, we're actually considering a range of values, an interval of values. The probability of being between 50 kilograms and 55 kilograms. And, and those intervals are represented by areas under a curve, as we'll see just now. We find a mean or expected value of each by summing um, all the, the x times the p of x values. And I'll, I'll show you kind of how that works. And we find the mean or expected value of a probability diff uh, density function by integrating, which is effectively summing as well, x times our, our probability function. Right. The mode has the highest probability of occurring in either. And on a probability density function, we find the mode by finding the x value of the turning point of the function. Right. That's the, that's the highest uh, probability of occurring. We find the median by making the probability equal to 0.5. A really crucial thing with all probability distributions is the sum of the probabilities of all outcomes is equal to one. Right, let's look at an example of each. Okay, so here I've got the probability distribution for the number of fish I'll catch on my next outing. So there's a chance of P that I'll catch zero fish, twice P that I'll catch one fish, half P, etc. Now those are all the possibilities and remember that for any probability distribution, the sum of all the probabilities have to add to one. Okay, so what we've got here now is we have the P plus the 2P plus the half P plus the quarter of P is equal to 1. P comes to 4 fifteenths. The probability that I catch at least one fish on my next outing, basically, I'd be happy with one fish, two fish, or three fish. And so I'm just going to have the complement. That's 1 minus the probability of no fish. And the probability of no fish is P, which is 4 fifteenths. So I get a final answer of. 11 fifteenths. Right, let's look at the idea of the expected or mean value. And you'll remember that I said that what we do is we sum the probabilities times the values. So, so the expected or mean value, um, 4 fifteenths chance of 0, 8 fifteenths chance of 1, etc. And we get our final expected or mean value of 1. Right, that's the average sort of expected value of number of fish that I'll get. Let's work out the variance now. So remember this formula that we saw just now. Um, the E of X we worked out up here. E of X squared, remember, we just square all these numbers here. Right. So I think I'm right in saying that we're going to get nothing from here. We're going to get still get 8 fifteenths here. Here we're going to get 2 squared times 2. That's another 8 fifteenths. So we got 16 fifteenths and here we're going to get 9 fifteenths. We're going to get 25 fifteenths in total. So that's that's this piece of the formula. Then we need to take away e of x squared. So we actually take away 1 squared, which is 1. So our final answer for our variance of this probability density function right, is actually going to be 25 fifteenths minus 1 squared or minus 1. So in other words, just uh, 10 fifteenths or 2 thirds. Right, that would be the variance of that uh, function. Okay, and as I said, it's kind of a measure of spread, uh, but we don't actually really do anything with it. Right, so now in this next uh, little piece, you're going to see the idea of working out an area underneath a curve using integration. Now, that's actually a, an AP Maths grade 12 topic that's part of the, the sort of main part of AP Maths, not part of the stats. So for our purposes, we're only going to give you ones that you would be able to work out using the area of basically a triangle half base times height. So I want you to, as we go through here, I don't want you to be stressed by these integration signs. They're like a long elongated S. Uh, just watch and work out how you would work out the area just using the area of triangle. Okay. Catch. Right, let's look at the probability density function. So this is the amount of time I spend waiting for a bus from uh, in minutes from 0 to 2. Uh, and here's the equation of this line. Now, we need the area under this curve to be one the total area under this line to be one i could work it out using uh, 
the area of a trapezium, if I knew that, or by resolving this into a rectangle and a triangle. But let's just use some integration. If I integrate my function kt plus 0 0.2 from 0 to 2, I must get 1. Now, what I've done here is I've split that definite integral into uh, two terms and I've factored out the k. This piece over here, I can type straight into my silver Casio calculator and work it out, and so can I with this piece. And so I end up with 2k plus 2 fifths is 1, or k is 0, 0,3. Right, then the next question is, what's the probability? So the total area under here is 1. What's the probability that I wait for between... Sorry about the very skew line and that one too. What's the probability that I wait for between 1 and 1 and a half minutes? Well, I'm now interested in that area. And that area will be a decimal between 0 and 1, and it will be that probability. So now I simply integrate with putting in the value for k that I've now got. I integrate my function from 1 to 1 and a half, and I get 0 0.2875, or approximately 29%. Now that's um, that's the, the probability in that case. We're now going to turn our attention to two special probability mass functions, and those are the binomial and hypergeometric distributions. Let's take a look at them. All right. The binomial only has two possible outcomes. The hypergeometric can have two or more outcomes. With the binomial, the probabilities are fixed. They don't change each time, right? And so, for example, throwing a dice, every time I throw the dice or the die, the probability of getting a six, for example, stays fixed, right? And um, with the hypergeometric, probabilities change. For example, if I've got a bowl of fruit, and I eat a piece of fruit on two consecutive days, the piece I eat on the second day, the chances of, of kind of selecting a certain type of fruit, fruit will be informed by what I ate on the first day. So typically hypergeometric without replacement, but in fact binomial can be without replacement given a large enough uh, sort of population. For example, suppose all the fish in the sea, of all the fish in the sea, 10% are shad. If I catch one and I, and I keep it and eat it, it doesn't fundamentally alter the probability that of 10% of, of, of the fish being shared. Okay, let's take a look now. These are the two formulas that are given for these two, the, the, the probability uh, mass functions for these two different types. And let's see how they play out. Okay, so let's look at an example of each. I draw a card from a well-shuffled deck. I note its suit, replace it, and shuffle. I do this 12 times. Now, this is definitely a binomial distribution because each time, my chance of getting a certain suit, right, I'm going to look, let's look at the probability that I get three clubs. The probability of a club is a quarter, and it remains a quarter each time. So using this formula, notice I've got these two probabilities. The probability of a club is a quarter. The probability of a non-club is three quarters. Note that these numbers always add to one, P, and one minus P. I want clubs to occur three times, and I want non-clubs to occur nine times, the balance of the 12 uh, drawings of cards. This number over here, this coefficient, is is a combination, and that ca accounts for the number of different ways, the number of different positions in which I can get the three clubs. I don't need to get the three clubs first up. I could get them on the first drawing, the seventh drawing, and the eleventh drawing, for, for argument's sake. So that sorts that out. Right. Let's look at the probability that I get at least one club. Well, that will be one minus the probability of no clubs. Right. And so I want probability of a club, quarter to the power of zero. I need 12 non-clubs, and they each have a three-quarters chance of happening. And then uh, uh, that can only happen, in fact, in one way. This coefficient here is just one. And then I work it out, and I get an answer of 96.8%. I want you to remember that answer because we're going to come back to it. I'm now going to write down the probability distribution for the number of clubs, and that really just uses this formula over here. So what I write down, I write it down like this. The probability that the number of clubs, big X, is equal to X is a quarter to the X, three quarters to the 12 minus X. My coefficient here at the front is the sum of those two numbers and then either one of them. So 12 X, 12 combination X. And X can take on any whole number value from zero to 12 inclusive. The probability of any other outcome is zero, so we write zero elsewhere. Remember this answer of 96.8% for the probability of at least one club. Now I'm going to do something similar but different. I draw 12 cards from a well-shuffled deck. 
Give the probability that I get two of each of the red suits, in other words, two, uh, two diamonds and two hearts, and four of each of the black suits. Right, now, I'm not replacing these cards. Notice also that there are more than two outcomes. Right, so this is definitely hypergeometric. And so the probability that I get two hearts out of the 13, there's the two, 13 combination, two ways I can choose two hearts from 13, two diamonds from 13, four clubs from 13, four spades from 13. On the denominator, you'll notice that the, the top numbers in the numerator add up to the top number in the denominator and vice versa. And the same with the, the bottom numbers add up to the bottom number. And we get a literally a one and a half percent chance that I, that I, that I would get. So this is not two of each. This should say two of each red and four of each black as, as the question re required. Okay, right. Let's look at the probability that I get at least one club. And you might remember that when I was replacing the cards previously, there was a 96.8% chance of getting at least one club. Now I'm not putting the cards back. One would actually expect an even higher chance. So the probability of at least one is one minus the probability of none. I want no clubs. Now, I'm not fussed with what these other cards are. They just mustn't be clubs. So I need 12 non-clubs out of the 39 not clubs remember that's out of the, our sample space is kind of 52 combination 12 and notice i actually get 98.1 percent which should give you a nice warm fuzzy feeling inside because it's slightly higher than 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 previously and as expected right we're now going to turn our attention to a very special probability density function and that is the normal distribution it has two parameters the mean and the standard deviation and it is symmetrical about the mean right as always the total area under the curve is one right and in fact this particular one that we've drawn here is what we call the standard normal distribution and it's got a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one and we can see that pretty much three standard deviations either side of the mean gives us just about all of our all of our kind of values in terms of our probability spread Let's just take a look at, uh, here's a normal distribution. This one's got a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Notice that if I, if I change the value of the mean, so for example, to two, the curve just moves. It doesn't change in terms of its shape. Well, I'm going to put it back to, to zero. Notice that if I change the standard deviation and I increase the standard deviation, the curve sort of flattens out and we've got a greater spread of the values around the mean. Whereas a smaller standard deviation, the, the, the values, the average sort of spread of the values around the mean is, is, is tighter. Right, I'm going to put it back to one and we can calculate a probability kind of either side. Uh, so, for example, I can ch I can change these values. But if I if I go one standard deviation either side of the mean, you'll see that the area, sorry, the area under the curve is about 0.69. In other words, there's about a 69% chance of being one standard deviation either side of the mean. It shouldn't surprise you that if I drag this kind of way across here and this one way across here, that it starts to look like one. It's a little alarming that it actually appears to uh, go over one. And that's, uh, yeah, that's a little slightly concerning. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't stress too much about that. It's a, it's obviously a, calculation thing with a, a, a Riemann sum of rectangles here but I'm a little I need more than sorry I would need more I've restricted the number of rectangles in terms of finding the area which is why it's going over two it's actually going over one so it definitely doesn't go over one so if that's added to any confusion now you'll be pleased to hear that you're not going to need to integrate this rather hectic looking uh, function over here in order to calculate areas under the curve. We've got a, a, a set of values in a table here for the standardized normal distribution, which has got a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, right? And when we look up a value, a Z value, we get the probability as as shown on the on the picture here um, of, of our value of a, of a data item Bet being between zero and our value. So for example, if I look up one, and that's one standard deviation, I actually get 34, about 34 and a bit percent. 
Now you'll remember that in fact uh, when I had one standard deviation either side because of the symmetry it's about 68 or 69 percent when I was when I was working on GeoGebra. Okay so let's uh, now have a look at something else that we can do. We can also work backwards in terms of we can go and say oh, here's a nice nice sort of looking value so 17 percent all right so 17 percent of our data lies between 0 and 0 0.44 of a standard deviation that would, that would give us kind of an area of 17 percent a probability of 17 percent okay but of course while real world data is often normally distributed it seldom has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one so we get given this formula on the data sheet which converts kind of x scores which are kind of real life data to z scores which are the standard normal distribution all right let's let's have a look at an example or two Okay, so the weights of 15 kilogram pockets of potatoes, pockets of potatoes that are advertised to be uh, 15 kilograms, are normally distributed with a mean weight of 15.2 kilograms and a standard deviation of 0.1 kilograms. What proportion of pockets would exceed 15.3 kilograms? In other words, what's the probability of getting a pocket of potatoes that exceeds 15.3 kilograms? So we're asking, what's the probability that X is bigger than 15.3? Now, if we have a look, remember our mean is 15,2, that's over here, all right, and this is 15,3 over here, all right. Now, we firstly convert that X score of 15,3 to a Z score using our formula Z equals X minus mu over sigma, the formula that is provided on the data sheet. And so that's the same as saying, what's the probability that Z is bigger than 1? Now, remember that if we look up 1, Okay, so 15,3 as, as an X value corresponds to a Z score of 1. If we look up 1 on our table, we get 0.3413. But remember, our table gives us the area back to the mean. Okay, back to zero, in fact, of the standardized normal distribution. So we need to subtract that from a half. Remember, the area under the whole curve is 1. The area under half the curve is, is a half. So we end up with an answer of 15.87. What's the probability that a random pocket weighs less than 15 kilograms? Let's look at this diagram. Remember, our mean is over here at 15,3. And now we're talking about a, an X score of 15. All right. And so 15,0. And so, in fact, that corresponds to a Z score of negative 2. Now, try as you might, you won't find a score of negative 2 on the table right you will find positive two right and this area over here will be exactly the same by symmetry as being bigger than positive two but remember when we look up positive two on our table we actually going to get this dotted area over here all right when we look up positive two on our table we actually get 0 0.4742 but we need to subtract that from a half to get this piece which is equivalent to that piece so we get a very small chance of 2.28 percent let's determine the probability that a randomly chosen pocket weighs between 15,1 and 15,4 right so in terms of z scores that's actually a z score of negative one and a z score of two all right this one's very straightforward to find this this piece on the right here we just look up the value of two in the table and we we already saw that value uh, previously there it is okay um, I seem to have copied the value wrongly but uh, one of them one of them wrong and then this this area over here the between minus one and zero is going to be exactly the same as between zero and one so we look up a value of one which if you've been paying attention you remember is about 34 percent and you add those two together right now here's a different question 30 percent of all pockets weigh less than what amount so what we're saying is what kind of x value what's what's the actual weight in real world terms of weights of pockets of potatoes that 30 percent of pockets will weigh less than right now if this is 30 percent in here then obviously this is 20 percent in here all right now if we go and look for 20 percent in our table all right so we are now looking inside the table and it seems the closest we get to 20 percent is this number over here 
all right and this number comes from a z score of 0.52 all right but looking sorry looking at our context over here you'll see that in fact we this would be negative 0.52 now remember that z and x are related via this formula all right and i know my mean i know my standard deviation and i can solve for x and in fact i get that 15,148. So this this kind of score here of 15,148 being an x value rather than a z value is the weight uh, which we can say 30% of pockets will weigh less than that weight. Right, having just uh, studied the normal distribution, now is a great time to look at the normal approximation to the binomial. Let's remind ourselves how the normal approximation to the binomial works. The first thing is that we need to check whether the conditions are met. There are two conditions. One is that the sample size times the probability of success is bigger than five. And the other is that the sample size times the sort of complement uh, is bigger than five. Right. So we'll, we'll look at an example just now. Right. Then there are two formulae given on the, on the formula sheet. Is a kind of expected value, which is n times p. It's also called the mean, all right? And there's the variance, which is n times p times q. Now, remember that for our purposes, we're going to use the standard deviation, so we're going to need to square root that result. Okay. The other really important thing is that we need to apply what are called continuity corrections, and that's because we are using a continuous distribution to approximate a discrete distribution. Right, so one's kind of got to get one head around these, right? But essentially, if we are going equal to a number, then we must go uh, from minus a half below to minus a half above. If we're going bigger than or equal to, we must go from minus a half below. If we're just going bigger than, we must go from a half above. If we're going less than, we must go, so less than or equal to, we must go less than half above. And if we're going less than, then less than a half below. Okay, correct. And we use this formula to convert from X scores to Z scores. Now, I think one of the, the big considerations is when does one actually use uh, the normal approximation to the binomial? And I don't suspect that questions are going to specify this. Let's just look at, it, at an example. So I toss it out 50 times. What's the probability that I get exactly three sixes? This is not a good question to use the normal approximation to the binomial because I can just do it directly, right? The probability of three sixes, this is a binomial distribution, will just be, uh, remember the probability of a six is one and six, okay? And I want that to happen three times. The probability of a non-six is five six, and I want that to happen 47 times. Right, and then I have a coefficient at the front here, which is a, a combination 50, combination 3. And this is allowing for the multiple positions on which I could get my three sixes or my 47 non sixes. When one works this out, right, let's just take a look at the value of 1,723%. Not a very big chance at all, right? I remember that number 1,723%. Right, I'll explain why in a bit. Right, now let's look at another example. And this one, actually still tossing a dice 50 times, says what's the probability that I get fewer than 10 sixes? Right, so now we now need to appreciate that it would take an age to work out the probability of zero sixes, add that to the probability of one six, two sixes, the whole way up to nine sixes. So it, this is a classic kind of this calls for the normal approximation to the binomial. The first thing I need to do is just to check n times p, right, is going to be 50 times 1 sixth. Okay, now 50 times 1 sixth is, is going to be 8 comma something. I think it's 8 and uh, 2 sixths. Indeed it is, right, which is bigger than 5. So that's good. Um, then we need to also check n times q. Now, remember, if p is one six, then q is five six. So five six. So this is going to be two hundred and fifty over six, which is way bigger than five. All right. And so I think we need to, uh, this topic's brand new in the curriculum this year, tested in the IB matric for the first time this year. 
So I, I'm pretty sure they're going to expect us to now say, therefore the conditions for the normal approximation to the binomial have been met. Okay, you can probably just say conditions have been met. All right. Next up, we need to now have a look. Uh, NP, uh, eight, uh, 50 over 6 is our mean. Right? And our standard deviation is going to be N times P times Q. It's actually going to be 50 times 1 6 times by 5 6. Square root. Okay, right. Now we are asking for the probability that x being less than ten. Right. So from our continuity corrections, basically we're going to not go with less than ten, but we're going to go with less than nine point five. Let's just kind of have a look at that. Less than ten, less than nine point five. Right, so we wouldn't put a 10 here, in fact, we would put a 9.5. Okay, now we convert this into a Z score using this formula. Z equals X minus mu over sigma. Right, so this uh, X score is going to be the same as the probability that Z is less than 9.5 minus mu, all right, now remember mu is 50 over 6. All right, um, over, this is actually going to be 250 over 36 inside of root sum. Okay, so let's uh, get that value. Okay, that comes to 0, 0,443. So Z less than 0, 0,443. And I'm just going to remind you how to do this on a calculator. All right. So if we bring up our calculator, if we bring up our calculator and we we put this into mode three one for stats. We go shift stat five and we're going for option two option two q of gives us exactly the same as our normal distribution table so in other words if i look up 0.443 i will get the value between there and zero all right so i'll need to add a half to this answer so i get 0.17112 so in fact my final answer will be 0.67112 or 67,11%. Okay. But but what I want to do is I want to show you how I can calculate these exact values on Excel. Excel's got a function called binomial dot distribution. Alright, when I open the brackets you'll see that its first parameter is how many kind of successes you want. So I'm going to go with that number there, zero in the first instance. How many trials, number of trials, that's 50. I'm throwing the dice 50 times. The probability of a success is a sixth. And then it says cumulative, and I'm going to say false. I don't want it to kind of uh, 
accumulate the, the probabilities. So I'm going to go with false. And that's the probability of getting zero sixes. Now, as I copy this down, what's very clever in Excel, you'll see if I go and look at that formula, it's counting the, the, the number, it's giving us the probability for the number of, of chance of two sixes. Just to show you, you might remember that answer of 1.73% or 1.723% uh, is is the one that we calculated earlier in this in the, in the example, right? If I drag that the whole way down, and if I let's just as a test here, let's just check the total of this column, All right? So I'm going to go for the sum of column B, and lo and behold, I get one, which I would expect. If I select zero, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, up to nine, right? Excel will total those and I actually get an answer of 68,3%, all right? So 68,3% is actually the exact answer, all right? So there has been some sort of sacrifice um, in, the, in the fact that this is an approximation, all right? But not a bad sacrifice actually, considering how much time I've saved. So that's the deal with the normal approximation for binomial. For me, the key issues are making sure you, you you know when to use it and i think that will be fairly obvious and then making sure that the conditions are met and then lastly just making sure that one's got that continuity correction correct okay sampling is a really important concept and we use sampling all the time in statistics what we do is we take a sample all right in order to make uh, inferences or deductions about the population the important thing when we sample is that our sample must be random it must be representative. In other words, it should kind of represent the, the population from which it's drawn. All right? And it must be sufficiently large. We can calculate the mean of our sample and we can use it to make inferences or deductions about the unknown population mean, which is called mu. We can also calculate the proportion, sorry, this should say, of our sample, which displays a certain attribute. And we can use that sample proportion to make inferences about the unknown population proportion. So we've got a kind of a sample mean and a population mean, a sample proportion, which is a P with a little hat on, so it's probably not all that clear, and a population proportion of pi. Let's look at an example. Right. Now the central limit theorem states that if you take a whole lot of samples, N samples, then they will be normally distributed with a mean, which is equal to the population mean, and a standard deviation equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the number number of samples right or the sample size rather uh, so let's have a look at this now if we wanted 90 a 95 percent area under our curve then obviously um, that means that we need a total of five percent in these two pieces here these would each be two and a half percent which would mean that this area here would be 47.5%, 0.475. Let's go back and look at our table for 0.475 inside the table, right? 0.47, uh, 0.47, I've, I've actually not got enough of my table here. I'll tell you that you get a value of 1.96, all right? And negative 1.96. Right, now what, what we want is we want the probability that Z is between negative 1 comma 9 6 and 1 comma 9 6 but we know um th that that actually corresponds to an x um here's our, our our formula again remember z equals x minus mu over sigma over root uh, over sigma but here now this the standard deviation is sigma over root n all right from here it's basic you can just follow it through it's just some basic algebra we end up uh, having to divide out a negative so our inequalities flick around and we basically end up with a range an interval from a certain number to another number that we can describe as a 95 percent confidence interval for the unknown mean it's a it's an interval in which we can be 95 percent certain that the unknown mean lies notice that it is symmetrical about our sample mean we add a certain amount and we sub so we add a certain amount and we subtract the same amount. Right. Let's look at let's look at an example. 
Suppose I take a sample of 16 Hilton metrics and I find that their mean weight is 82 kilograms and the standard deviation is 5 kilograms. Find a 95% confidence interval for the unknown population mean. Now we get given this formula on the data sheet and really the only, well apart from obviously our sample mean and our sample standard deviation and the sample size, the only other kind of variable is Z and that is a function of what size confidence interval. Now you might remember that a 95% confidence interval corresponded to a, a Z score of 1,96. So I literally plug in the numbers here and I get an interval and that interval is an interval in which I can be 95% certain that the mean weight of all Hilton metrics lies, the entire kind of population. Right, just a, a kind of an important concept. If we have a look at the formula, right, I'm just going to leave the formula just at the top there. You'll see that confidence intervals can be reduced if we increase the sample size. If we have a bigger sample, then we can we can be more confident, all right? We could have a smaller standard deviation. That's not something we can control. That's kind of a function of the population. But we could also decrease the percentage confidence. So these work in kind of inverse proportion to one another. If you decrease the percentage confidence interval, uh, sorry, then the then the confidence and they don't work in inverse proportion at all. Um, they work uh, then the the confidence interval also uh, become smaller. Okay. Right, here's a, a slightly different way of asking, asking the question. We've given the confidence interval, we also know, uh, sorry that I've used the same 95% confidence interval every time, it is a common one. Um, so we know the sort of Z value and we know the sample size. What was the mean and what was the standard deviation? Well, the key to finding the mean is remembering that the, 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 the interval is symmetrical about the mean. So if we find the average of these two values, we will get the mean. Right, now remember that we get our, our upper value by taking our mean plus Z sigma over root N, N being the sample size, and that we know our upper value is 2556, and the only variable left in here now is sigma, and I can work that out. I could just as easily have gone minus and gone with my lower, lower uh, value of 2444. Right, note just an important thing, if the standard deviation is not given in the question then and, and we've got our sample then we need to calculate it using our sample but in this case we would find s on our calculator we'd use this this version uh, in other words we'd use the, the sample standard deviation rather than the population standard deviation interestingly in core maths is kind of a a standard approach whereby we always use uh, sigma which is the population standard deviation which is a bit bizarre because most of statistics is about sampling so in fact it would, it would typically be more more be, it would be more accurate and more correct to use the sample standard deviation of s right we can also generate confidence intervals for the unknown proportion of a population which displays a certain attribute. So as we mentioned before, if our sample population proportion, uh, uh, sorry, sample population proportion, what a load of garbage. The sample proportion is P hat, all right, and the, and the population proportion is pi, then very similar to last time, we get that, all right? And this formula, gets given to us on the data sheet in much the same way. Okay, p hat plus or minus z, z being the z value associated with the confidence interval. Now this time we're gonna do a 90% confidence interval. Right, the question is actually asking something slightly different in terms of how bigger, how bigger samples should we take? And we'll get to that now. But a 90% confidence interval means that we've got 5% in each of these kind of wings here, which means that we actually would need naught comma four five here and hopefully i can fit this value in on my table let's go to back to our table here okay naught comma four five we will see uh also not <laughs> also not joy okay but it comes to a value of one comma six four five all right um Goodness gracious. Okay, 1,645 and minus 1,645. So the, this question is actually saying to us, right, what, how big a sample should we be in order that our confidence interval basically is within 2% of the 7%? In other words, our confidence interval is going to be 5 to 9. 
Right, and remember we cal calculate the upper value of our confidence interval by going p hat plus. All right, and so here we go. We've got the 1.645, which is my z-score. P, our, our proportion is 0 0.07, so one minus a proportion 0 0.93. And in fact, the, we're adding this value to get the upper the upper value on our on our limit here, our nine percent. The only variable left is n, and I can solve for n, and I get about 440. So that's the sample size I would need to to establish a confidence interval which is within two percent of the the expected proportion of seven percent. Okay, almost there. The hypothesis testing is an important thing. It allows us to just statistically test a claim that is being made on the basis of a sample. We always test with a given level of significance. We first set up a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is what we will believe unless we find a good enough reason to change our mind. It is the status quo. In other words, the null hypothesis is presumed until we find sufficient evidence that it is false. A kind of innocent until proven guilty. So let's take an example. Suppose we say that the null hypothesis is that our mean is 100. We now need an alternate hypothesis. An alternate, our alternate hypothesis, H1, is what we will go with if there is sufficient evidence to reject our null hypothesis. So next we establish our, our, our reject and do not reject region. And this is a function of the level of significance and whether we have a one-tailed or a two-tailed test. We might be interested in, as our alternate hypothesis, as the mean is not 100. So the null hypothesis always involves equality. It always has an equal sign in. Whereas the alternate can be unequal, all right, or less than or bigger than. Now, unequal is what we call a two-tailed test. It could be different in either direction. The one-tailed tests involve a definite decrease where it's definitely smaller or a definite increase where it's definitely bigger. Now, if we're going with, a, say, a 5% level of significance and it's a one-tailed test, then we look, we, we establish our, our sort of Z-score here according to 5% in the one tail which obviously would mean that we would go and look up 0.45 in the table and we get a value of 1.645. Likewise, with a one-tailed test for a definite decrease. If we've got a two-tailed test and a 5% level of significance, then that 5% is going to be shared between the two tails, 2.5% uh, in each, and we would get 0.475, 47.5%, and that would give us a, a value of 1.96. On the outer limits over here, sort of uh, on the extreme left and extreme right, or in this case, just on the extreme left, we call this the reject region, all right? And with closer in here, we do not reject, right? So our, our reject and do not reject regions are going to be a function of whether it's one-tailed or two-tailed and the level of significance. Right, next up we calculate our test statistic and we get given this formula on the data sheet for the test statistic. Right, so, and then finally we make our conclusion. If our test statistic falls in this, in this region here, then we would not reject, okay? If it falls in this region, we would reject. And our conclusions are as follows. We either say there's sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis, or we say that there's insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate hypothesis. The first conclusion, this one, would be considered a strong result. The second, a weak result. Right? There's not sort of enough evidence to do anything, whereas here the evidence is overwhelming that we need to reject H0. We never conclude that there's sufficient evidence to support or accept the null hypothesis. We're either rejecting it or failing to reject it. The 5% level of significance means that there was a 5% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis when it was in fact true. This is called a type 1 error, while a type 2 error would be to not reject the null hypothesis when it is false. Okay, so in summary, the steps to conducting a hypothesis test are as follows. State the null and alternate hypotheses. Decide on the significance level that's normally given in the question and establish the rejection region based on whether it's one-tailed or two-tailed in accordance with your hypothesis. Calculate the test statistic 
and then state your conclusion in words. Right, let's look at an example. So an athlete finds that his times for running the 100 meters are normally distributed with that mean and that standard deviation. He takes on a new training program. Thereafter, he, he uh, kind of, there's a sample of five days and, and he, he finds that his mean time is now 10.4. Right, is there evidence at the 2% level of significance that the training has improved his time? So what we're gonna say is our null hypothesis is that his mean time, is that the mean time is 10.6. The alternate hypothesis is that it's less than 10.6. Have the times improved, right? Improved, obviously got less. Um, and this is at the 2% level of significance, so single tail. So we would need to go and find 0.48 in the table, and that corresponds to 2.05, but in fact, negative 2.05, right? There's 2% in there, okay? And now we calculate our test statistic using the formula that we're given, and we get a test statistic of negative 2.98. Now that's over here somewhere, so we're in the reject region. We can now conclude that there is sufficient evidence at the 2% level of significance to reject H0 in favor of H1. In other words, his training has improved his times in a statistically significant way. All right, or by a statistically significant amount, sorry. It is also possible to conduct a hypothesis test to compare two different means from two populations, and we're given this formula. In fact, a far more useful formula, which we're not given, would be this. All right, and I'll, we'll have a look at an example now. So suppose school A claimed that over the past five years, their average metric science mark has been more than 5% better than school B's. So we take a random sample of 35 metric science results from each school. We get the mean and the standard deviation of each of those. All right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna conduct a test at the 4% level of significance to test their claim. Now they're not claiming that the results are just different. They're claiming that they are um, better by more than a fixed amount. So so what the the sort of uh, null hypothesis is that the difference in the means is 5% and the alternate hypothesis is it's more than 5%. That's the kind of claim, right? So we're gonna conduct this test at the 4% level of significance, which means 4% there, 46% there, which corresponds to a Z score of, of kind of 1.75. Next up, we're going to calculate our test statistic and we're going to use this this formula here now if if we were just wondering whether there was a difference between the two then so yeah so for example uh, then we would be saying uh our null hypothesis would be that the mean of x is equal to the mean of y if we were just looking for a difference okay notice the null hypothesis always has an equality an equal sign this is equivalent to the mean of x minus the mean of y being zero. And that, that's kind of the application of this formula when there. So, so here we actually saying that we want a mean of x minus the mean of y to be five, right? So we calculate our test statistic and we get the following value, all right? Which comes out eventually to 0.51. Now 0.51 is over here somewhere. All right, and so we in the do not reject region. So we would conclude that there is not sufficient evidence at the 4% level of significance to reject H0 in favor of H1. In other words, school A's claim that they've, they've uh, outperformed by more than 5% cannot be upheld. Right. Okay, I thought it'd be useful to just finish off by looking at the formula sheet that gets supplied in the metric IV exam and essentially we're going to use a very similar one for the grade 11 AP maths exam. So if we start top left, uh, we've got the formula for the probability of an event A happening. That's actually given in core maths. We've also got the formula for the probability of A or B being the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. That gets given, to be honest, I haven't seen it uh, required uh, we certainly won't require it yeah, for our grade 11 exam uh, now. But this one in the middle here is to do with conditional probability, and we're not going to supply that one. Uh, we haven't we haven't done that topic yet. It's a small piece, um, so we won't supply that one in its place. I will be giving uh, this one over here, which is the uh, 
formula for D, calculating a standard deviation or a variance. Okay, right. So let's just go through and see what else we've got. Permutation, combination. This is our binomial uh, distribution. This is our hypergeometric distribution. This is the mean of uh, the binomial distribution for use with the normal approximation. All right. And this is the variance for exactly the same thing. This is uh, NP and NPQ. And remember that's variance. You need to square it to get standard deviation. This formula you'll be totally familiar with. It's for converting uh, sort of X scores to Z scores. This one over here is is the one that we use when we are doing hypothesis tests to pick both of these. The one on the left is for kind of a single a single sample when you're just uh, looking at one one uh, population and one attribute. And the one on the right is when we are comparing two populations. So for example, kind of the weights of two different uh, uh, yeah, let's say two different companies' uh, products or whatever. Right. This here, and I've just marked the the confidence interval stuff. Confidence intervals, they kind of two types. There's types where we are concerned with the sort of weight or the measurement of an attribute, and that's where we use this formula. And then the other one is a proportion one, where where we kind of interested in say the proportion of people that are left-handed or the proportion of tins that have got Afrikaans labels. And a lot of people were kind of trying to use this formula for the proportion one. So those are the two confidence interval ones. But these two, this is the expected value of a probability distribution, uh, sorry, probability density function, all right? Uh, also known as the mean, and this is the variance of a probability density function. So there shouldn't be any formulae on this data sheet that, uh, yeah, that you're not familiar with or, or ready to use. Okay, all that remains is for me to wish you all the best. I will do a a document uh, revision pack with uh, questions and answers uh, ahead of your of your exam for you to practice on it.